Hello, everybody. Welcome to our midweek service, midweek Bible study. It is the 17th of February. We have a lot of things uh, to pray about today, so we're going to take a little extra time on that. Uh, we're going to be studying from 1 Samuel 24, and I'll try to keep it um, relatively short, but um, by way of prayer, um, I want to continue to pray for Eric Hickman. Eric is um, in at home. He's actually at his um, Tiffany, his ex-wife's mother's house here, here in Merced. Um, you can go visit him if you'd like to. Um, you can contact me uh, to get the address and anytime. Um, uh, the door is always open for visitors um, between eight in the morning and nine at night. And Eric likes to have visitors. He's in a lot of pain. He is in stage four cancer and uh, not sure what the treatment is gonna be in the future, but it's something to certainly pray about. And for that, also uh, Rick DeBusk, um, night before last, so that would have been Monday night, uh, him and uh, Becky were working on uh, her daughter's bathroom and he collapsed and stopped breathing. And uh, Becky had to give him CPR and it was successful. Um, but he had a, like an AFib, a rapid heart, and, uh, and doctors um, do not believe it was a heart attack. They're still running some texts. I think he's had an angiogram today uh, to get results to try to find out if there's a blockage somewhere maybe, uh, but it was uh, very scary for Becky, and uh, Rick does have some broken ribs as a result of the CPR, and he's still at Mercy uh, waiting for results and trying to find out what may have caused it. Uh, so be praying for that situation for sure. Our daughter-in-law, Shaylee, is in Colorado, and she is in the hospital this morning. Um, she had a diabetic reaction, but I, I just heard from Ryan and that she'll be going home soon this afternoon. She's feeling much better, and so we'll be praying for that. Uh, Don Shepard, who is the director of the Awana camp that we take our kids to every year, um, great friend of ours and he is in the VA hospital and uh, I think it's uh, last I heard it was an uh, infection of a kidney so uh, we want to pray for him and uh, just continue to pray for a friend of mine Mike Headley who's waiting for a bed at Stanford to deal with uh, some internal bleeding issues and then also Susie uh, will be um, day will be traveling home I think she's scheduled to come home tomorrow but she's got some major decisions to make about her dad and her dad's health. And she just asked for prayer and those decisions. So well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, Lord. There's so many different things this week. We pray for uh, Rick DeBusk and for the doctors to find out what the issues might be concerning his heart, what caused this collapse and uh, be with Becky as she uh, has been through a lot this week. Lord, we lift her up. And uh, for Shaylee, thank you. She's going home today. We want to pray, Lord, for um, Eric and his situation uh, with his cancer, Lord, and just pray for healing, Father, for complete outer turnaround of this thing, Lord, and just pray for uh, Tiffany, his ex-wife, and also for Josh and Alexis, his kids, and, and Lord, Ron, for sure, we just lift him up, Hickman, as he's been uh, really struggling with this, Lord, and we want to pray for um, my friend Mike Headley and Don Shepard, and uh, for Susie and the issues with her dad and her traveling mercies as she comes home. Uh, bless our study as we look into your word today in Jesus' name. All right, thank you for that. Just keep those in your prayer. It's been a, um, a little difficult week in, in that manner. And just, uh, uh, let's turn to First Samuel 24. We will be uh, meeting live tonight at seven o'clock on Wednesdays and also still doing live services on Sundays. And if you want to uh, get to the sermons online, or you're watching this, so either you saw it on Facebook, or you can go to YouTube, BCC Legrand, and uh, there's all a list of messages there, music and things, if you want to see those. Um, so we ended chapter 23, where Saul kind of had David surrounded. David's been running from Saul, and Saul's been running from God. Um, God has determined that the kingdom will be taken away and God's spirit was removed from Saul and kind of came on to David. David is a man after God's own heart. 
Uh, but Saul's not happy with God's decision, and he thinks he can change God's decision by eliminating God's man, David. And so he had him surrounded at the end of chapter 23. But if you look at uh, verse 27 of chapter 23, there's a messenger comes to Saul um, saying, hurry, come for the Philistines have invaded the land. So Saul has to turn around, even though he's got David cornered, and, and go take care of the Philistines. Well, chapter 24, the Philistines have been taken care of, apparently. And it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines. It was told him, saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel, went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So this place En Gedi, um, I, I Googled it and hit images, and I would encourage you to do that. It's a very strategic place. It's actually got kind of a creek running through it, and there's caves everywhere, um, but it's it's got some green grass, and it's, it's kind of a oasis in this desert, and it's very uh, good for hiding. These caves are big enough to, to even have uh, herds of, of goats and sheep in there, and so this is where David, remember his 600 men, they're kind of hiding up there and uh, trying to wait out what God has uh, for them in the future. Um, meanwhile, here comes um, Saul back at it again. Um, and so um, they're in this little place called En Gedi. So verse three, so he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend to his needs. The King James says, cover his feet. Um, and David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. So picture this. There's caves all over this place. And the 3,000 men, so it's big enough for 3,000 men to, 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 to be gathered. And Saul has to attend to his needs. And again, the old King James says, cover his feet. That cover his feet is the idea of using the restroom and, and lowering your robes and they cover your feet um, or attending to his needs. But uh, and, and other um, translations talk about him uh, resting or sleeping. Um, but the attending to his needs gives us more of, a, of an aspect of him being by himself, the idea of him having privacy. And, and that's what's really important here is that he is away from the 6,000 or the 3,000 men that were with him to protect him. And so he goes, of all the caves he picks, he picks the cave where David and his men are there. Um, well, if you were there, God's will would be pretty obvious, wouldn't it? And to the men of David, it certainly is. Look at verse four. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. So a couple things here. Um, this quote from David's men is there's, there's not a scripture you can go to where they're quoting God. Although the, the, the principle is there in which it says, um, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand. God has promised David victory. Um, but the second part of it that says um, that you may do to him as it seems good to you, there doesn't seem to be a place where God actually said that. Um, and so because of that, um, David really is in a quandary. The, the idea of taking care of your enemy, it does seem like the obvious thing to do. And here's the, 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 the verse, in Proverbs 3, 6, it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. 
uh, we're never really given permission by God to do everything as we wish. Um, and God is going to take care of David. He's already promised him that he's going to be king. And so what a way to become king. I'll just kill the enemy right here. And, and, and it was logical to the men. But we're, we're not to act in haste. Um, the Bible says to call nothing uh, hastily as being holy. And so David actually does have direction from God on what to do. Um, and so as he goes and gets close enough to Saul, whether he's sleeping, it's in a dark cave, you can't see him, but somehow he was able to get a hold of his robe. There's thoughts that as he was attending to his needs, maybe bathing or something or washing himself, that the robes would have been put to the side so David could have got the robe that way. Um, but he was able to cut the robe without knowing it. Uh, so he didn't kill him. And I don't know whether he was even planning to as he went there. Um, but here's what we've got to be careful to do. A lot of times you'll hear somebody say, well, God's going to do something great this year, or God, God's going to bring revival to this city, or, or you know, uh, I really think God's going to bless you this year. God has told me he's going to bless you. And we have to be careful that we don't trade the phrase, well, the Bible says this for the phrase, or God told me this. You know, God told me this is going to be a great year. God told me that we're really going to have victory. God told me that that Trump's going to get reelected, or God told me that the, uh, he's bringing, you know, judgment to this world. All the, what God tells us is what's written in the scriptures. And so we want to be careful that we don't attribute our will and say it's God's will. So the men really wanted, this would be great for them. If, if they could get rid of Saul, they wouldn't have to live in these caves anymore. David could be king. They're with him the whole time. It'd be very beneficial to them. Uh, but David got there and thought twice about it. Or maybe he wasn't planning at all, but he just cuts the robe. And look at verse 5. It says it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. I mean, it was bad enough that, that he cut the robe. And certainly he, he would have been tremendously guilty had he been had he killed him. And so he is uh, brokenhearted a little bit conviction and, and this is all the Holy Spirit because David knows the right thing to do here um, in what seemed like the obvious thing to do wasn't the right thing and and it's never right to do the wrong thing uh, John 16 7 Jesus is talking about sending the Holy Spirit and God gives um, in John 16 7 uh, and 8 a description of the Holy Spirit he says if I go away the helper will come. Uh, it, he says, if I don't go away, the helper will not come. But I will send him to you. Verse 8 says, and he, when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit has a convicting ministry. Uh, it's what works in our conscience. And it worked in David's conscience. And so what drives us to obedience is the Holy Spirit and that convicting work and also scriptures. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God in 2 Timothy 3.16. And it's profitable for reproof and correction and instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So David's response to the men after he feels bad in, in verse uh six as he said to the man the lord forbid that i should do this uh, thing to my master the lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him seeing he is the anointed of the lord so david restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against saul and saul got up from the cave and went on his way so i want you to watch how this worked with david David is in this cave hiding from the enemy Saul. Saul comes in by himself to attend to his needs. The men give him great advice, what looked like great advice. 
God's delivered your enemy into your hands. Go, do him as you wish. And as David drew closer, the conviction of the Holy Spirit in him, or the conviction of God, and then the knowledge of the word, not to touch God's anointed, uh, really struck him. He cuts the robe and immediately feels that little check in your spirit that he's done the wrong thing. And when he goes to the man, he says, look it, Lord forbid that I should do this thing. So the word of God brought him correction, instruction, and righteousness. And the Holy Spirit brought him conviction of sin. And what he knew was that God had told him how this thing was going to end. He was going to become king and David would be, a Saul would be removed. But it wasn't up to David to push that thing through. It wasn't up to David. And, and sometimes, you know, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And God is long suffering and his timing is perfect. And, you know, if, you, if you've been called to preach, so to speak, the, the Bible also teaches that you're not supposed to be a novice. So are you willing to be patient and wait out that, that time in your life when you're called to do it? Um, so I was looking at this idea that David's, the lesson to David was not to go against God's anointed. And there's a couple of verses. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 John chapter 2 on this subject of anointed. And, and when you look at the definition of anointed, it means to wipe feet, or, you know, and, and kind of to acknowledge as being God's will. Um, but we, we have a good definition of an anointed because here's the problem. We have taken this word and we have applied it to this idea of a king. And we have actually lifted ourselves as pastors, as those that are anointed. And that, oh, this word is really anointed. My sermon was anointed. And don't speak, you know, when, when someone comes to the pastor and says, you know, pastor, your sermons are too long. And then we immediately respond with, well, you're not to touch God's anointed. As if, because maybe the sermons are too long. You know, and, and, and maybe this is somebody trying to give you some good advice. So here's what the Bible says about anointed in the New Testament. And I, I found this a few years ago. First John chapter 2, verse 20. The Bible says, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And verse 26, um, or verse 27. Uh, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just that it has been taught to you, you will abide in him. So when you look at the anointing in 1 John chapter 2, it's, it's the truth. It has to do, you look at verse 20, you know all things. And verse 27, no one needs to teach you because you have the truth. And so that anointing, of the Holy Spirit for me was the day that through God's work only, I was given this gift of knowing that the Bible was God's truth, knowing that the gospel was true, knowing that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. The truth that I am a sinner and the truth that the wages of sin is death and the truth that God demonstrated his love towards me that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. That is the message of the gospel. We've all sinned through Adam. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So in this idea that, that I have an anointing or a gift from God of knowing the truth through the Holy Spirit, then the anointing back in Samuel is not so much the king, but the realization from David that the truth is he's not supposed to go and take the kingdom for himself. It's going to be, he's already been promised it by God. So he doesn't have to do anything to make it happen. And we see all kinds of examples of that in scripture of, of man trying to manipulate God, whether it's Joseph's brothers throwing him into a pit and selling him off 
to make sure they don't ever have to bow down to them. And all it did was cause them to bow down to them. But they meant for evil, God meant for good. Whether it's Esau selling a birthright, he really had no right to anyway. And, and then uh, the mother of, of Jacob putting hair all over him in order to trick the father and to give him the blessing when God already said the younger, uh, the older would serve the younger. And so we have all these examples of people manipulating things but God just keeps getting his way. God knows what he's doing. It's God's anointing, God's will, if you would say, or God's truth. And so sometimes we take that word God's anointed and we put it on me, like, like the pastor is God's anointed. No, the, the, the words that I read you from scripture are anointed. The, the, the sermons are not anointed, but the, the, the words in the scripture within the sermon are anointed and if i am saying to you something that's from the scriptures that message is already anointed it's not anointed because i pray 12 hours a day or because i'm so chosen by god no i'm nothing i'm not i'm, not, I'm not, no better than the donkey that talked to balaam um but the words are different and so when david is going back and talking about not touching god's anointed what he's really saying i believe is i don't have a right to to play God. I don't have a right to go and, and take that guy out that God placed in there as that kingdom. Um, so sometimes I think we get that mixed up. Um, so let's still see what David does back in uh, 1 Samuel 24. Um, and we're going to look at verse 8. So David uh, also arose afterwards. So Saul's left the cave. At verse 8, he goes out and calls out to Saul what a chance he's taking. And he says, my Lord and King, little L, humble. He says, my Lord and King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. See, David is waiting his turn. He is not going to force this kingdom. It's so different from how Saul works. Saul is doing everything to stop God's will. David is doing everything to not go ahead of God's will. It's so interesting. Um, so David says to Saul, verse 9, uh, why do you listen to the words of the men that say, indeed, David seeks your harm? That's an interesting statement by David because it wasn't the men telling Saul that David seeks harm for Saul. It's Saul telling the men. And so he's twisted it a little bit out of humility and maybe trying to save face for Saul in front of all the men. He says, look, this, your, uh, this day your eyes have seen the Lord deliver you today into my hands in a cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord for he is the Lord's anointed. You're the one, this is God's will. This is the truth that you're supposed to be king. And I could have killed you. It says, moreover, my father, see, yes, see, the corner of your robe is in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. And know that and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand. I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. What a great verse that is. It says, look, I could have killed you, but I'm going to leave this in God's hands. I trust the Lord, and he has anointed me to be king, chosen me to be king, but right now you're still there, and I am not going to go and mess with God's will. I'm going to wait and be patient. How about you? Are you waiting on the Lord for anything? Can you be patient? Don't push ahead. You may, you may push things out of his will. Just, just follow the, the kind of lead of the Holy Spirit. Follow the scriptures live day by day and, and whatever you might be waiting for uh, god will bring it in due time um and then let the lord be the judge as the proverb of the ancients say in verse 13 wickedness proceeds from the wicked but my hand shall not be against you he says if i was wicked i'd have killed you because what comes out of a wicked person is wickedness and it would have been wicked for him to have taken his life after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? I'm nothing. Therefore, 
Let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hands. You know what? And, and that's the way it is with, with kind of the spiritual debates. You know, when I die, either uh, the, this word is right or it's wrong. I'll stand before God and I pray I hear well done and, and I won't know. God will be the judge. Some people would look at me and say, oh, Pastor John, I know you're going to hear well done. You're such a great person. They don't really know me. Other people will say, you're just a fake. You're a phony. You're just doing this for different reasons. Uh, you have selfish motives. Well, they don't know me either. Um, but God knows me. And, and he'll be the final judge in, in everything. And that's what he's saying. He said, look, I could have ended this right now, but I'm not wicked. You say I am, but I, I think my actions today prove that I'm not. But you know what? God's going to be the judge. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. And you're going to stand before God someday to answer for your life. And if you are a Christian, your sins are washed away. But if you are not, you will stand before him and your name will not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and he'll be the final judge. So give your life to Christ. Trust in him. Just at least give him a chance. Read about him. See what, see what he's got to say about different things. Um, but, but don't listen to the voices, the, the, the anti-Christian or the pro-Christian or the this preacher and that preacher. And that's just get away from the noise get the anointed word of God because a person talking on Twitter, a person preaching on the internet, unless they've got the scriptures in their hand and the, the, the verses out of their mouth, uh, then they're just spewing stuff. All right. And, and it can't be trusted. The man said, go take that guy, kill him. That wasn't God's will. And David was sensitive enough to the spirit of God and the word of God to make the right decision and the right choice. I'll look at verse 16. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, uh, that Saul said, is this your voice of my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. The Bible says that, that if you feed your enemy, it's like heaping coals of fire on his head. And that the coals of fire is the idea of, of, of comfort. You know, they, they needed coals to survive. And, they would carry them often on their head. And so this is an idea of, of having a real effect on him by, by being kind to your enemy, showing mercy. And he says to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. See, uh, we live in a world where good is evil, evil is good, but God can bring a change in conviction at any time he wants. That's such an important thing to remember. You show me this day how you have dealt with me. And when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. Verse 19, if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done for me this day. Verse 20, very important. And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king. Saul knows it. He's kind of always known it. And so now he gets to this point where he is having a, a change of heart you would think and he says the kingdom of israel shall be established in your hand therefore swear to me by the lord that you will not cut off your descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name and the name of my father's house so we see a a, a change in here um proverbs 25 i just quoted this it says if your enemy is hungry give him bread if he's thirsty give him water to drink for so you will heap coals of fire in his head and the Lord will reward you. There, there's, a, there's something to this. And this kindness of this enemy had a temporary effect on Saul. It was just temporary. Um, why was it temporary? Well, remember, God removed his spirit from Saul. But Saul still battling with this kind of flesh and spirit. And, and, and God has uh, decided to deal with him in a certain way. Um, and we get this a lot. Sometimes, you know, we will uh, preach this emotional sermon and we'll have an emotional kind of a, a interaction and, and uh, you know, we'll have dramatic music and call people up and we'll have this emotional kind of uh, end of the service. And 
And people can make emotional decisions, but they don't last because a, a relationship with Christ is not based on an emotional response. Remember, the heart is wicked. But the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So true salvation is when your, your mind is, is changed towards there is no God to there is one God and it's Jesus Christ. And when you're transformed, you become a new person and it's long lasting. Uh, it's eternally lasting. And so we have to be careful that we as preachers don't start toying with people's emotions in order to, to get them to make emotional decisions. If you read Joshua 24, you'll see a good example of this where the people keep saying they're going to serve God. And, and, and Joshua says, we'll see, we'll see. And, and sometimes that's how it is. We'll see. And, and this has got me in trouble at times in the past when people have made decisions. And I'd say to them, well, we'll see. And, and they'll say, well, what do you mean? God came to me. This is a change. But we'll see. If there's a transformation, it's, it's long lasting, but it, it takes a while sometimes. But sometimes we as preachers can manipulate that emotional decision in order to get kind of uh, spiritual notches on our belts about how many people have come to know Christ and how many baptisms and how many came forward and how many did this. But it's easily... Uh, emotionally manipulated. Paul here is, is, is with his emotions. But if you look at verse 22, it ends with David swore to Saul and Saul went home, but David and his men went to the stronghold. Well, if they were so confident that this was a major change in Saul's life, why did they go back to the cave? You think David knew? And he's seen Saul go up and down and throw spears, and he's seen the spirit come upon him. That was kind of from God, this distressing spirit. And so we just want to keep on preaching the truth in love. Man, and, and, and I know that Christ is the way to go. I know that he is the way, and he is the truth, and he is the life, and he comes to give you abundant life. So there's no notches in the belt. I don't get any um, credit. And, and if you turn your life to God and, and by hearing this uh, sermon, you don't even have to t tell anybody uh, associated with this. This it's not that's not what it's about. Uh, we love you, and we want you to know the God that we know. We want you to know the truth of the gospel. And, and I pray that, that you will see this in the way that Saul did, but in, in a true transformation way, by renewing your mind, Romans uh, 12, 1, 2. I just pray that would be what happens, that your thought process would, would change through the Holy Spirit and that you would get that anointing that God gave me 40 years ago to know that this book is the word of God and and to live by it. I hope that's where this takes you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing of your word. We pray for all those who are uh, dealing with physical issues today. Uh, bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and we will have live service tonight at 7. Same message. Uh, might be a little different with input, and then Sunday at 10 o'clock, we'll be back in Hosea. God bless you.